Welcome. It's my extreme pleasure to serve as a moderator for today's Ask an MS Expert webinar. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. I'm also a non-scientist member of the International Progressive MS Alliance's Scientific Steering Committee, where I work to ensure that the perspectives and priorities of families affected by progressive MS are represented in all the projects and work undertaken by the Alliance. I'm a district activist leader for the National MS Society, and I also chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. I'm also dealing with an allergy this morning, and I want to assure you that it's only an allergy. There's no fever, no cough, and no shortness <laughs> of breath. So please don't be alarmed if I happen to sneeze. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm thrilled to be with you today. I see that people are continuing to join the webinar, so let's give them another few seconds and then we'll get started. This webinar is really all about getting answers to the questions that are on your mind. So before we get underway, I want to review how you can submit your questions. If you aren't familiar with how GoToMeeting works, you had a choice of joining today's webinar through your personal computer or your phone. If you join the webinar using your computer's mic and speakers, you'll have the ability to submit comments and questions through the chat box that you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. You'll also see a hand icon that you can click to raise your hand and submit a question. As I chat with our experts, please feel free to submit your questions as they come to mind into that chat box. We'll be sure to take time to address as many of your questions as we can. Now, I know many of you might have some very specific questions related to your own situation. Because of our limited time together, we're going to be focusing on the questions that pertain to everyone. Now, following the webinar, the questions that we're not able to get to will be addressed in the Society's FAQ section of their website, and you can always contact an MS Navigator to receive personalized attention to your particular question. You'll find contact information for the MS Navigators on the MS Society's website. Obviously, I can't make this webinar happen all by myself. There are a lot of amazing people working behind the scenes. And one of them is Julie Field. And Julie is going to help me today by pulling together your questions in the background while I'm busy talking. We may even get Julie to read some of those questions herself. I should also mention that due to the large number of participants we have today, everyone has been placed in listen-only mode. And if you're interested in reviewing today's discussion with our experts, well, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available on the Society's website for your reference. Today's Ask an MS Expert webinar is one of a series of virtual opportunities the Society is committed to offering. Hearing your questions and listening to what's on your mind is going to help shape future Ask an MS Expert webinars, so I hope you're ready to participate. Our objective today and our objective in all of the Ask an MS Expert programs is to connect with you, share important information that you can rely on, and provide a forum for you to connect with experts on the topics that are on your mind, the topics that really impact people affected by multiple sclerosis. Now, in last week's Ask an MS Expert webinar, we looked at answering your questions about the risks of contracting COVID-19 if you're living with MS, what sorts of complications someone living with MS might face, and we got some specific advice about how to best manage our disease-modifying therapies in light of COVID-19. These are the same questions that we've been talking about on the Real Talk MS podcast, and your interest in getting answers to these questions has been evident by the huge number of downloads that those recent podcast episodes continue to receive. Just a reminder, you'll be able to replay last week's webinar right on the MS Society's website at nationalmssociety.org 
and you'll find all the past episodes of Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com. Today, we're going to separate fact from fiction when it comes to COVID-19 and MS. We'll talk with our experts about some of the rumors and false information about COVID-19 and MS that are already starting to make their way across our screens. And we're also going to talk about coping with uncertainty during these very challenging times. Now, some of the questions that I'm already seeing come across include better understanding some of the fiction about the impact of COVID-19 on people living with MS and knowing what are the facts. Several of you have submitted questions about looking for specific things that we can do to build our resilience, to better cope with uncertainty. We'll also provide you with key resources that you should know about so that you can stay connected with credible, reliable information about MS and COVID-19. And we really wanna to spend today answering your questions. So please keep submitting them as they come to mind. Before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge that these are new and rapidly evolving times, so we do have a disclaimer to review. COVID-19 is a new coronavirus, and there are currently no published data available about the virus and MS. The information and recommendations presented in this program are based upon the professional opinions of MS experts and the evidence currently available about MS, infections, and disease-modifying therapies. This is a rapidly evolving situation and we'll update information as it becomes available. Please be sure to check the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19 to keep up with the most updated information on MS and the coronavirus pandemic. Now let's meet our experts. Kathy Costello is the Associate Vice President of Healthcare Access for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. In this role, she leads the Society's strategic initiative on access to quality healthcare, which focuses on self-advocacy, professional workforce development, healthcare professional relationships, and wellness. Kathy was a nurse practitioner and adjunct assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins MS Center located in Baltimore, Maryland and she's written and lectured extensively on MS and MS care. Kathy received her BSN and MS from the University of Maryland. Damian Washington is an actor, rapper, nerd, and professional vlogger who lives with MS. Damian is from New York City. He started acting when he was a little kid and attended LaGuardia High School of the Performing Arts while doing some theater, voiceovers, and commercials along the way. After getting his BA in theater and Eastern Asian religions at Middlebury College and acting for a few years in New York City, Damien found his way to Los Angeles where he currently lives. Damien serves as an inspiration to thousands of people in the MS community through his upliving, uh, excuse me, his uplifting YouTube vlogs about his experiences living with multiple sclerosis. And you can check out Damien's vlog at youtube.com slash no stress ms finally dr kevin allshuler is a rehabilitation psychologist with appointments as an associate professor in the department of rehabilitation medicine and adjunct associate professor in the department of neurology at the university of washington he is psychology director for the uw medicine multiple sclerosis center and at the university of washington dr allshuler works clinically with patients with multiple sclerosis and other chronic medical conditions. His primary role is to help patients develop effective strategies for managing the physical and emotional symptoms that present with their medical condition. He's also an active researcher and Dr. Allshuler's primary areas of focus include chronic pain, adjustment to medical medication, adjustment to medical condition, and the multidisciplinary treatment of medical conditions currently with the emphasis on multiple sclerosis. I think we're gonna start our conversation today with you, Damien. So let me ask you, can you tell us about how you got started vlogging? And most importantly, what are you hearing about COVID-19 from the MS community? 
Well, I got started vlogging because as a performer, as an actor, you have to make your own content. And all, out of all the content that I made, uh, the only content that thousands of people watched uh, was my content about multiple sclerosis. And I was like, well, this isn't exactly fun, but I will make content about MS right now. Um, and, and so that's, I've been doing that for a couple of years and it's great, the community has been growing. There are thousands and thousands of people there. And we are talking about COVID-19 and there are no real easy answers, um, but people are concerned about, you know, starting their DMT or stopping their DMT. Um, but uh, there are a lot of different things that I hear and ultimately um, each case is individual. Um, so that's where the conversation picks up to talk to your doctor and everyone gets all the information they possibly can from each other, the community and all that good stuff. But then they talk to their medical professional and see what's best for them. Um, so that, that's what I would say to, to that job. So aside from disease modifying therapies, uh, I'm wondering, are you hearing any other specifics of the kinds of things people might be worried about? People are just worried about um, having compromised immune systems and um, dealing with the world with this thing. That's the main issue um, because MS sort of just takes a, a little bit away from you each time you feel like uh, you don't have as much to deal with the regular things in the world. And now the regular things in the world are this is this virus that we've never seen before um, that is a, it makes people really sick and or kills people. So that's something really to deal with. Um, and uh, MS sort of is a disease that helps you reach out to your community and other people with MS. Also, MS is a disease that helps you uh, tuck it in and rein it in and sort of see what's going on within you and uh, take that um, up as much as you possibly, possibly can. Um, I, that, that's all I'll say about that for now. So I'm wondering, is there anything that you are wondering about yourself that maybe you're not sure about? Uh, you know, I would say personally, I would say no, because um, I'm a storehouse for information. And my last vlog was about MS and COVID-19. And my next vlog is going to be about DMTs and COVID-19. Um, so I'm uh, ridiculously researched uh, about this type of stuff, which makes me happy to be here today to share in some of that knowledge, but also to hear from doctors and other people in the community to um, hear about other things that I might not have thought about and plug any gaps and any holes. And so make, make me um, as uh, prepared and ready to face uh, this, this pandemic as I possibly can. Well, let's let's do that right now. Why don't we talk to one of our experts? Uh, Kathy, I'm hoping that you can address some of the fiction or misinformation about COVID-19 that the society is starting to see surface. And, and, and what are some of the facts that, that people really should be keeping in mind? Great. Thanks very much, John. And, and to everyone, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm really happy that so many people are participating. I'd like to start off by saying that, you know, we're all looking for answers and particularly during a crisis. And COVID-19 is likely the biggest crisis that any of us have faced and the entire population has faced. But people, all of us, human beings, we need to feel hope and we need to feel like there are answers. And right now, to some extent, because this is so new, we aren't functioning in a vacuum to some extent. And that produces such an enormous amount of frustration and actually fear. And what happens is when we're not getting the answers that we want so desperately, suddenly other things, other answers seem to make suddenly sense, whereas maybe two months ago, they didn't make a lot of sense. And so I'm hopeful that I can sort out some of that in the next maybe four or five minutes. So the first thing that, that we've been hearing, and, and I think that Damien has heard it as well, is that people with MS are immunosuppressed. That's actually false. People with MS have a different functioning immune system for sure, but that does not mean immunosuppressed. Suppressed means that there's not enough cells available for you to fight infection, right? In this context of infection, that's what we mean. In MS, there are immune system cells that are causing inflammation and damage in the central nervous system. 
specific to how the messages travel within the brain and how they then will get out of the brain and then into the other nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. But within the brain, that's where the problem is with MS. But that does not mean the immune system is suppressed. And in fact, people with MS are not more susceptible to getting COVID-19. And there is no evidence to date, I'll bet mostly anecdotal, but there has been no evidence to suggest that the course of infection, should someone get COVID-19, the course of infection is not more serious because someone has MS. Now, there are other reasons that we can talk about that increase risk. And actually these are noted in some detail on uh, the National MS Society website. Uh, and also you can find these on the CDC website for who is at greater risk. And that's whether you have MS or not. So another myth that I hear or a fiction that I hear is that people should be getting a prescription for chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. And these are the anti-malarial drugs. And that's actually false. No one should be getting these. There are no approved drugs right now to treat COVID-19. That's not because there's not effort. There's an enormous amount of effort in the research community, in the pharmaceutical community, in the biotech community. Everyone is racing to try and find something that is effective to, against COVID-19. And there have been clues that have come out of, on certain types of drugs. But I will say the American Medical Association just put out a notification and announcement today to providers as well as uh, the population, the people, to say, don't hoard these drugs. Don't be prescribing these drugs. We don't know if they're going to work. And in fact, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have a lot of toxicity. And just getting a prescription and taking it can actually be very dangerous. It can cause liver failure and even death. So it's very important to wait until we have something that has been proven. Which brings me to the next uh, fiction, which is drugs that are already approved don't need to be tested. I wish that was the case, but that's actually false. Uh, each time we think about a new indication for uh, an existing drug, it really does need to be tested. We have no idea if these drugs are going to work, and we have no idea if they're going to be safe in a particular population unless they're tested. Now, clearly things are ho happening very fast and testing is hoped to happen very fast as well. But having drugs out there that have not been well investigated is dangerous. And it's actually giving false hope when we need real hope. So I've also been hearing, and actually so has the FDA, that there are home test kits for COVID-19 being advertised on the internet. This is fiction. People should not be spending money and ordering a home test kit from the internet. It has not been vetted. It has not been tested to see that it, it, it's an actual real test. And people would be getting false information and then operating with that false information. The tests that are out there, I'll bet we'd like to have more test kits every day. But those test kits that are out there and being used by offices and hospitals those are the tests that have been investigated, tested, and we know that they're giving valid answers, which is really what we need are true answers. So there are drugs and supplements available online to treat COVID-19. This is also false. As I've said repeatedly, at this moment, there are not treatments that are approved to treat this uh, uh, infection. There's a lot we hear about supplements. Uh, that people can take a supplement and that will prevent them from having an infection. That's not clear if that's true or if that's not true. And when people are suggesting that we take medications that boost our immune system, traditionally for people with MS, we've really recommended against that because boosting the immune system theoretically could increase MS activity. So we generally tell people to stay away from that. So we can talk more about some of that later, but these are just some of the things that I've heard. And one last one, that COVID-19 lasts for weeks and maybe months on surfaces. And that's probably not true. In fact, there was just a recent paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine that noted how long COVID-19 lasts on surfaces or even in the air. COVID-19 is spread by coughing or sneezing, 
droplets from our uh, respiratory tract. Those droplets don't last in the air for very long and they actually fall to surfaces. On surfaces, they have different lifespan. So on cardboard, for instance, in this paper, it lasts about 24 hours. On surfaces such as plastic or stainless steel, maybe a few days. On copper, for reasons that I don't know the chemistry behind, only a few hours. So that does say that washing of those surfaces frequently uh, is kind of important. And we can talk a little bit more about that later because I think there might be, uh, I'll bet, questions that we might hear just about that. Well, you know, Kathy, Damien had mentioned that he was hearing chatter specifically about disease modifying therapies. And we're also getting those same kinds of questions about whether you should start a disease modifying therapy now or whether you should stop a disease modifying therapy now. What are the facts about disease modifying therapies as they relate to COVID-19? Thanks for asking that, John, because this is really quite a hot topic, as it should be. And the problem really is that there's so many mixed messages. There's guidance coming from all different corners, literally of the globe, that is great and well intended, but causes a tremendous amount of confusion. I spent my morning today taking a look at all the different guidance that's out there from the Italian Neurological Society, from the UK MS Society, from Australia, from our National Medical Advisory Committee, from the Multiple Sclerosis International Federation. I've talked to experts from around the globe and asked this very question. The bottom line that I have heard, do not stop your disease modifying therapy. At this point in time, there is nothing that says you should stop. Now, having said that very broad statement, are there instances where that may need to happen? Yes, and that's the crux of every one of these recommendations, is that at the end of the day, this is an individualized decision and multiple factors need to be taken into consideration. I mentioned earlier that there are factors that make anybody more susceptible to infection. That can also occur in people with MS, if we're of older age, if we have other types of medical conditions that may already make us more susceptible to uh, infection, including COVID-19. There are certain types of disease-modifying therapies that may need to be discussed. Often people are now bringing up the disease-modifying therapies that deplete or lower certain cell populations, ocrevus, rituximab, alemtuzumab, these cladribine, these are drugs that may lower certain immune system cells. It's not a slam dunk and an absolute conclusion that these drugs should be stopped, but because of their cell depleting qualities, they should be discussed between the person living with MS who's on these drugs and the healthcare provider who's managing their MS to determine if in that particular individual, someone should go on or someone should stop or postpone their therapy. So I hope that helps. And for those new people who are just getting started, you know, MS, as we all know, can be pretty darn aggressive and it can cause a lot of problems for people with inflammation and damage in the central nervous system. And so by and large, our recommendation is start that disease modifying therapy and have that conversation so that you're well aware and informed of the risks and benefits of every one of the therapies in general and certainly in the context of COVID-19 and make that shared decision on which of these therapies is best for you. Well, thanks, Kathy. I know a lot of people are gonna benefit by so many of those answers, I appreciate it very much. Dr. Allshuler, you know, living with MS has always meant living with uncertainty. No one ever knows if or when they might experience an exacerbation. No one can predict if or when they might wake up with a new symptom or, or wake up one day where an existing symptom that seemed kind of minor might all of a sudden seem something more major. Now those feelings of uncertainty are being compounded by the uncertainty surrounded, surrounding COVID-19. It's challenging to cope with the limited and changing information that we hear about the virus and the impact that it's having on people's lives. 
So what do we know about how people cope with this level of uncertainty? Yeah, John, thanks for having me. And I think you're exactly right. This is certainly a population uh, that understands uncertainty. And one of the things that I've been hoping is that maybe uh, this group of listeners will have a head start on everybody else in terms of uh, having some tricks up their sleeve to manage uncertainty. So we know that uncertainty is distressing for everybody. And we think, in fact, that uncertainty is probably one of the root causes of anxiety for people who feel anxiety. And in general, if we have something in our life that is uncomfortable or creates distress, our goal tends to be to try to make it stop. And one of the challenges with uncertainty, of course, is that we can't actually make it stop. So people try things, right? They try to avoid it. They try to escape from it. They try to pretend it's not there in hopes that if they don't think about it, they won't feel distressed by it. Other people think a lot about it. They try to solve it. They try to find every piece of information in hopes that they'll eliminate the uncertainty by creating uncertainty, by grabbing control of the situation. And of course, in a truly uncertain situation, that's not actually possible. So our goal as psychologists is to push people to the middle. We don't want them ignoring what's going on. We want them to pay enough attention to it that they're doing what they can and what's within their control. But we also don't want people spending extra time where there's actually the creation of more distress and more distraction from other aspects of life. And I'm sure we'll get into that here in the next few minutes. Well, I understand that the society has funded research around this, and I'm wondering what you can tell us about the research that you've been doing. Yeah, absolutely. So five or six years ago, I, along with um, one of our trainees at the time, Megan Beyer, who's a psychologist now at Johns Hopkins, um, she and I started looking at the concept of intolerance of uncertainty. So in the anxiety literature, there's some work around this idea that different people have a different abilities to tolerate the presence of uncertainty in their lives. And the less able a person is to tolerate that uncertainty being there, the more likely they are to kind of go to one of these extremes to either try to ignore it or grab control of it. And that really stuck with me as something that seemed relevant to our patients. Um, so in the these last five or six years since then, uh, another psychologist at, at the University of Washington, Ivan Moulton, and I have been working on how can we help our patients improve their ability to coexist with uncertainty. We know that living with MS, we're not going to be able to eliminate all the, the uncertainties there. So we want to help create basically experts at coping or coexisting with the uncertainty. Um, our traditional psychology approaches have focused on the distress that comes from that. So if a person's coping poorly with uncertainty, they might get anxious and we try to treat the anxiety. Our thought was, let's try to work more with the uncertainty itself. And ideally with, with newly diagnosed patients or individuals who are early in their life with MS in hopes that we can help set them up with the tools to live with that uncertainty successfully going forward. And so we're now on our second project, uh, fortunately funded by the society, and we're looking to see if our new approach is as effective as our older approaches. Well, I want to circle back to some of those specific steps you talked about in just a moment. But before we get there, I want to ask, what is it that makes coping with uncertainty so difficult for some of us? Sure. So, you know, I think I think one of the the things that we all probably realize if we take a step back from uncertainty is that we'd all rather know what's going to happen than not know what's going to happen. Even if what even if what we know is something bad, right? Even if we know there's going to be a, a big problem ahead of us or a big challenge, um, that tends to be more comfortable for people because they know there's something in front of them that they're going to have to approach. Um, so, so one thing we know is, is certainty almost always weighs out as more comfortable than uncertainty. But in the present challenge, I think it's not just the uncertainty, but it's the uncertainty intersecting with the threat of the situation. 
You know, I think COVID-19 is both uncertain and there's an unknown to it, but also there's this whole element of that it's threatening to our sense of well-being. It's threatening to people's ability to uh, make a living. Um, it's threatening to our way of life and it's threatening to our health and, and potentially life or death. And so I think that intersection of the unknown along with the threat of, of what comes with that unknown is really making things a, a lot more difficult for most, most people uh, across the world at this point. Well, let's turn to talking about what we can do to best interrupt or smooth out those feelings of uncertainty that lead to anxiety. What are some basic tips that can help people as we try to cope with this new level of uncertainty and, and potential risk to ourselves that we all see every morning when we wake up and turn on the news? Yeah, so I appreciate that perspective. You know, I think we're trying to find ways to better manage this situation. We're not going to solve it. Um, what I what I sent to you for this slide that that is up on the screen for everybody right now is kind of three broad areas to think about. So the first thing that we all need to do is is kind of take that step back and recognize how we're feeling about the uncertainty. And I know that's the more kind of woo-woo or fluffier side of psychology, um, but I think it's really important because we live a lot of our lives by reacting to how we're feeling in the moment. And you know, our brains are these great computers and you know, they're kind of programmed for what we need to do. If we're hungry, we eat. If we're tired, we sleep and so forth. And so if we don't like the way we're responding to distress, we need a way to, to really think you know, thoughtfully about how we're approaching it. And so it's important to pause and think about, you know, how are you feeling about the uncertainty? How are you responding to it? And recognize whether you wanna make um, some changes. <clears throat> um, so, so that's the first step, it has to happen. We can't skip that step. But once we've recognized that, okay, I do feel distressed by this, I wanna manage it better, then there's two paths to take. The obvious one is we need to control the things that are within our control. And as obvious as that may seem, I think it's very important to think about, um, think in advance you know, about what you're trying to control. Because if we try to control things, but in the context of feeling distressed, we're gonna try all kinds of things. And we're probably gonna go well beyond what's actually within our control. So it's important to be you know, guided by something that's factual, something that's accurate. You know, there's clear guidelines right now about staying home, about staying you know, six feet away from people, about not being around people who are sick, about washing your hands. Those are the things that are actually within our control, as well as having a few weeks of supplies on hand. Um, so it's important to attach yourself to the guidelines and not just go with what you feel like in those moments, because undoubtedly you'll come home with $5,000 in toilet paper, for example, by trying to control everything <laughs> that you can control. The harder part and the, the part that I think um, we end up focusing on more as psychologists is, is the other piece of this, which is that once you've controlled what you can control, there's still a huge part of this that is out of your control. And so that means there's still gonna be this piece of uncertainty, piece of uncontrollability, unknown, that's going to create uh, distress. When we feel distressed, we respond as if there's a threat in front of us. So we have a physiological response to that. Our system's ready to fight or run from that threat, the fight or flight response. Um, our thoughts and our behaviors are about threat mitigation. So we want to know where the threat's coming from and what I can do to, to combat that threat. And then, of course, in the current circumstance, we're also limited socially. Um, we may have made some mistakes in terminology with social distancing. We should be physically distant, not socially distant, but certainly there's an increase in isolation with everybody being at home. So for this piece, what, what we need is we need everybody working to build a, a set of strategies that counteract that threat-based distress response. 
Can we calm the physiological system, either formally through relaxation or meditation? There's great meditation apps out there now, which, which people can do on their own. Or a less formal thing, going outside, getting some fresh air, going for a walk, um, talking to a friend, you know, things that just have more of a calming effect for us. Can we refocus ourselves away from the threat and the news and all the information seeking that so many people are doing and focus back on doing all the other things in life that add value? And I'm not saying ignore the news. I'm not saying pretend like this isn't there because I said that's a problem as well, right? But it's, you know, take the time to get updated on today's news, today's information, but then don't forget about the rest of life, the things that you enjoy doing, the people you enjoy uh, interacting with, the hobbies you might have, the exercise you do, and so forth. And then lastly, on the social piece, I think we should all be thankful it's, 2020 and not, you know, the flu epidemic in 1918, um, we can stay connected just as we're doing on this webinar. Um, in our house, we have visitors every day. Uh, we have uh, grandparents, we have aunts and uncles, cousins, friends, all coming to us by FaceTime, by Zoom, um, and, and so forth. And, you know, this has actually been a great chance because we're not as busy to be in touch with other people. And so counteracting that social isolation. So all of these together, we're not trying to ignore the problem. We're not trying to pretend like it's not there. We're not trying to pretend like life is, is what it always has been, but we're trying to make it proportional and not have it be an all day, every day bundle of distress. And instead make sure that we're doing the things within our control to manage that distress. What about family members? These are people who aren't living with MS, but are certainly affected by MS. Uh, they're also obviously affected by this increased uncertainty surrounding COVID-19, but also may have additional worry about that family member who is living with MS and now having to cope with the threat of COVID-19. Do you have any specific advice for those family members? Yes, yeah, so I think it's interesting you bring this up. I think in terms of COVID-19 itself, we probably all need these strategies, MS or not. Um, when we think about this in relation to MS though, I think that the, the way uncertainty presents is different for family members and for people living with MS. For people, with living, people who are living with MS, the uncertainty is uncertainty about something that's happening to them. With family, there's this extra dimension of being one level removed from it, right? Now it's uh, this uncertain thing that's happening to this other person and I wanna help and I wanna control what they can't control, right? And so this isn't a better or worse thing, but I do think it's experienced differently. And so, you know, I think ultimately good relationships are a partnership. And if we can work through guidelines such as the ones that I've provided here, it gives a chance to work together to do the things like the controlling the controllables, working together on focusing life on the things that are meaningful, um, working together on limiting the focus on the distress. So ultimately it can be a partnership, um, but it's important to recognize that we each in our own groups or in our own individual styles experience the uncertainty a little bit differently. Thank you for that. I think I'd like to ask Damien, as someone who is living with MS, Damien, what are some things that you've been doing to cope <laughs> with uncertainty? Ah, breathing. <laughs> That's one big part of it. Um, also, I'm mainly, as a performer, as an actor and entertainment professional, um, I make my living in uncertainty. I swim in uncertainty all day, every day. Um, so I have a bit more of a um, uh, focused perspective on being comfortable when things are uncertain. I'm not saying it always feels good. In fact, it most often doesn't. Um, but I'm uh, present with that because I, I have a meditation practice and that's something that I picked up because of MS. 
And, you know, a, a lot of these um, things people mention, like, you know, meditation or taking walks or, you know, the, doing these things for yourself. If you're well on the outside of that, you kind of really don't feel that it's a solution. You're like, my current self doesn't think that that's a good solution. How would that help? That's dumb. Or you're, you say, okay, fine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna meditate. And then you only meditate for, you know, seven days and like not consistently. So there's something to sort of having an ideal of yourself and then working toward that. Um, that's one of the best things that I, um, that's how I sort of work through it. Um, a, a lot of, a lot of the things, uh, that Dr. Alshula said, um, about sort of controlling what you can, what you can control. Um, that's a big, huge thing. And, um, that I, I, I reiterate that because a, a lot of times the feeling comes from things you can't control or the feeling comes from things you can control, but you don't feel that they will um, overtake the things that you can't. And that's fine, we're all dealing with uncertainty in some way. And I think recognizing that is the first step into saying, all right, everybody's feeling uncertain. All right, how does this feel in me? All right, you know, I can't, this, this feels three ways to me. I can take care of the first two, that last one, mm, that's kind of um, still kind of messy. I'm still working on that one. Um, and just sort of be, give yourself the grace to know that this is a process and this will take time. And the world, um, the earth is still spinning, but the world has stopped. Yeah. And that's not, um, it, that's not an opportunity for you to dig in on all these bad feelings. It's an opportunity for you to step back and know that there is another version of yourself that is more calm um, and dealing with this type of stuff out there somewhere, you just have to go and find them. So I'm curious, <laughs> how have you and your wife been managing through these times together? Well, you know, my wife is way more of a brain than I am. Um, so she's been reading things. Uh, she's been um, sort of getting her dossier together uh, about this, about this topic since you know late November, early December, when it was just overseas. Um, so that's a big thing um, is, is being sort of um, knowledgeable about what's going on um, so that you can at least have something close to facts in your brain to temper um, the uh, feelings of uncertainty that, that come along with it. Um, there, there's the, the idea of reclaiming your space. Like uh, my wife and I, you know, my wife has been working from home. And now that we've had this um, set of time together, like, like we, it hasn't been since we were in college. <laughs> it's more like, all right, fine. This is the living room. I'm going to move this into the bedroom. I'm going to move this into the hall closet. And now this is the area where we have our video chats. This is the area where we put our rice cooker and our water and stuff. It's sort of doing what you can in your space to reclaim some of uh, the, not certainty, but the idea of, yeah, I can control this, I can control that. There's a lot of I'm not in control that is associated with life in general, but multiple sclerosis, COVID-19, the, the, the intersection between the two. So focusing on what you can control is sort of what has been a big part of um, our wellness in this household. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Kathy, I'm wondering if I can ask you a question from someone on, the, uh, on our webinar right now. Aurora has a fact or fiction question for you. Is okay. it true that if a person was taking Advil or ibuprofen before the coronavirus for general pain, then the virus is harder on your system. Thanks for that question, Aurora, and it's a great one. It's really been out there on the internet quite prominently, particularly in the last week or so. And there was a report um, that came in, maybe more than one, that maybe being on ibuprofen could activate an enzyme that may make some of the symptoms worse in COVID-19. However, the FDA, who is all over this, is, has been unable to substantiate that with any evidence to say that ibuprofen or any of the drugs in that class called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
So these are the Advil, the Motrin, uh, those types of drugs. There's no evidence to substantiate that. The World Health Organization actually put out uh, a statement saying, well, maybe you ought to use acetaminophen or Tylenol instead. And they've actually rescinded that because there's not been any hard evidence to demonstrate that ibuprofen or any of the other uh, NSAIDs uh, are problematic. So at this point in time, that would be a fiction and that we have no evidence to substantiate ibuprofen or like drugs being problematic in COVID-19. Well, thanks for that. I have another question for you from Casey. I'm a caregiver for someone that has MS. And my question is, what sort of precautions should I be taking when I return from going to the store or the pharmacy? I've heard if I have groceries that I should leave them in the garage for three days. And if I can't do that, then I should disinfect or clean every spear of asparagus, for example, that I bring into the house. If this is indeed the level of precaution that I should be taking, should I also change my clothes when I get home or take a shower right away? Wow, these are great questions, Casey, and I really appreciate you uh, sending them in to us. So as I had mentioned earlier, that this is a, a droplet spread infection and droplets land on surfaces. So hence the question, my gosh, if it's all over these surfaces, what, what in the world do I need to do? I need to defog everything before I bring it in the house. So it's unlikely that the surfaces that you're talking about are the major ones to transmit this infection. It's probably very low level. Having said that, there are some precautions that are prudent. So for instance, when we go out to the grocery store, whether it's you, Casey, or anyone going out to the grocery store, when you bring your things home, don't put them up on your countertop. Put things on the floor and take your groceries out. When it comes to fruits and vegetables, we don't know darn well that we're in the grocery store, we're touching things, we pick it up, we feel it, we press on it. Well, not that one, I want that one. So now we've touched 10 different things. So washing our fruits and vegetables is always important, whether it's in the context of COVID-19 or just good practice. So yes, you should wash. I wouldn't say scrubbing with 60% uh, alcohol, but I would say that washing off your vegetables and fruits as you always have uh, is probably a good idea. So when you get deliveries for, uh, and something comes in a cardboard box, uh, this is might be a little over precaution, but leave it outside and take the goods out of it and bring them into the house. Uh, because we do know that uh, COVID-19 can live on cardboard for about 24 hours. Now I will say probably the last person to touch it was the delivery person and before that it was probably some time before anybody else touched it. So again, the risk is low. For those people out there who are healthcare workers, for instance, and they're out there on the front lines and, and thank God for every one of you, but when you come home, it's probably good to shed those clothes and wash them and take a shower. Uh, and that's probably good practice for anyone who works in a hospital anyway, because you know hospitals are just loaded with all kinds of bacteria and viruses on a good day. And now we have this heightened uh, fear and anxiety because of COVID-19. So I don't, I don't think we need to wash every sphere of asparagus in quite the way you're thinking, but I do think we need to wash our vegetables. And so that means letting the water rinse on them uh, as you would at any time. Um, those vegetables that you can scrub, like a potato, for instance, I think just do the same practices that you've always done. So I hope that's helpful, John. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Okay. And now I have a question for Dr. Allshuler. Uh, Lisa wrote in saying how grateful she is for a program like this, and she's asked, how can I tell the difference between just having a bad day and needing to seek professional help? That's a great question. And that's one we as psychologists often receive in, in these types of events. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One is, is that life isn't perfectly even. We expect there to be ups and downs, good days and bad days. And I think right now it's a little bit more like we're out in, in rough seas, out in the ocean. Um, so certainly choppier waters than we're used to. A bad day is a bad day, right? It lasts for a day, it lasts for you know two days, something like that. Um, 
that's okay. This happens in the course of normal, you know, everyday life, and it's going to happen in the course of our current circumstances. What we tend to look for is what is the impact of this? Is this sticking with you? Is this changing your outlook on life? Is it changing the way you're functioning? Is it changing the way you're interacting with people who you care about? Um, is it having those types of effects beyond just you know, not feeling so great for a day or two. That's when we're ultimately most concerned, right? When we see this prolonged impact, this prolonged change, um, that's certainly when somebody um, really should should look, you know, to, to get some help either from a trusted friend or advisor or from a, a professional. With that said, I'm very much of the school of thought that we in, in the mental health field don't need to just help people who are in their worst space, right? A lot of us could do better, even under the best of circumstances. And so the approach that we've taken in our clinic is we're here for everybody. Anybody who wants to handle things better um, is welcome to come and see us. And I think most psychologists would feel that way. So while you may need help the most when it's this prolonged change that's really impacting life, if you're eager to get um, some kind of help, if you're eager to get some advice on how to handle things better, you don't have to wait until you're suffering. We also received a follow-up question to the discussion you and I were having about some of the coping skills that people can use. A uh, person wants to know, what are some coping skills that I can do in the middle of the night when I can't seem to control my thoughts and actually relax? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, nighttime and sleep are one of the most challenging times for, for a lot of people with their, their thoughts. You know, to be able to fall asleep, we have to be able to let everything go. And yet, when we try to go to sleep, that's the time of day when we're least distracted, we're least occupied. And, and so it's often the time where it's hardest to keep things from flooding in and, and overwhelming us. So there's a lot of people who have trouble calming their, their thoughts either when they go to bed or after they've woken up in the middle of the night. Some basic things to think about is we don't wanna lay in bed for more than 15 or 20 minutes um, with our thoughts. And so if we're having a hard time uh, falling back to sleep in the middle of the night and you know, thoughts are you know, racing through our mind, that's a good time to get up and and either walk downstairs and get a glass of water or go sit somewhere and read for a few minutes. Try to reset and restart. Because what often happens is once we get to that 15, 20 minutes, we start trying to sleep. And as soon as we're trying to sleep, we're really not going to sleep. We need to be able to let go. So for most people, resetting is, is one of the most uh, useful things they can do. For individuals who've learned uh, mindfulness or relaxation strategies, this is an added benefit where you can try to use some of those at, at those times as well. We've heard that one way of reducing stress related to the pandemic is to reduce the amount of time we're watching cable news instead of having it on all day, just checking in once or twice a day. But what about social media? Does checking social media sites like Facebook and Twitter serve to heighten or alleviate stress? I think that we want people to be, the term they're using in our hospital, situationally aware, right? We want everybody to know the basics of what's going on. What, what is the general situation? What is the risk? And, and you probably get most of that through standard news outlets, public health updates, and so forth. Social media has always been a, a blessing and a curse. It's a great way to get quick information. It's a great way to interact with people. But I think there's also a tendency for most people to post out on the extremes. Things are going great or things are going horribly. And if we get too much into that, we start getting pulled across that spectrum over and over. And oftentimes the, the true news, the true facts kind of lay right in the middle. And so there's diminishing returns and probably ultimately even harmful returns if we spend too much time on it. So I'd say situational awareness is the goal, right? Understand where things stand today, 
check in with your friends, check in with people who you like to interact with. But being on there endlessly is probably taking away from time that could be spent doing things that add to life and, and make your life better. And, and while there is so much information available online, as we've been discussing today, not all of it is equally reliable. So exactly. I'm wondering, Kathy, would you mind stepping in and maybe pointing us in the direction of some key resources that we can have confidence in and know we're getting reliable information from? Absolutely, thanks so much, John. So of course, the National MS Society, I believe, is an excellent source. Uh, my colleagues and I work very hard to keep that information as up-to-date as possible. Uh, we are searching uh, the sites that are, we also feel are um, reputable, such as the CDC, which is noted here on the slide, the WHO, the Multiple Sclerosis International Federation. We also believe that when people have questions and the written word on the page on the website is just not helping, we really encourage people to reach out and contact an MS navigator. These very, very skilled and highly educated professionals can provide you with information that you need, resources in your community that will be useful. So I, I recommend that to everyone. And they can be reached by email, they can be reached by phone, and that phone number is 1-800-344-4867. And let's not forget Real Talk MS, because you have had some outstanding podcasts about everything but certainly throughout this crisis with COVID-19, helping people to cope with anxiety, understanding what to do around disease-modifying therapies are two that come to mind for me. Also, Damian Washington, uh, your YouTube, No Stress MS, it's funny, it's helpful. There are speakers that can provide uh, very useful information, so something, again, highly recommended. In general, when people, and we will say this to people when they're newly diagnosed as well, when something says .com, I'm a little worried because it may actually, yours is a .com, but some are really not out there with great information. So they often, be careful, they could be trying to sell something. Now what you have is really good information, but people have to be careful. So we're telling you from a .org, I might say, that this is a good site. But when you're out there on your own, look for those .orgs, look for the EDUs as your first pass. And then you can vet the other sites through those good sites that we feel confident about. And again, if you have questions, I highly recommend an MS Navigator. Thank you, Kathy. Damien. I know you like to focus on sharing a laugh to lift our spirits and help us gain a new perspective. Before we end, do you have anything you'd like to share with us to help lift our spirits today? I know and can say without a doubt, under all the anxiety, under all the fear, there is the human that you are uh, that is full of joy and full of hope. And it's, it's crushed at the bottom of that box, like Pandora's box. That hope is crushed, man, and it's looking hard. So uh, how I can even laugh at things is um, the more clear my mind is. And uh, like, I, like I've, it's been said before many times, the meditation thing, it's not so much that I meditate and now I'm better. I meditate and I am practiced in the notion of seeing a thought I don't like, and then maybe I'll let it go. Maybe it'll come back as well, um, and then it'll attach to me and I'll have nasty emotions and stuff. But um, the practice of just being able to let a thought go and pay more attention to the lamp you're seeing or your cute dog and have those emotions start to um, come to you a little bit more and then become more dominant. There's a factor of we are not in control in our lives and uh, I am not in control of my life, but there's a factor of control in your life and I am in control of my life. And in the way that I am in control, I'm in control of taking a pause. 
and saying, you know, that feels like anxiety. That feels like anger instead of, man, I'm anxious, man, I'm angry. And like I say, for, for myself, this is a, a coin flip game. Sometimes I'm good at it, sometimes I'm not. But when you're able to say, you know, there, here comes some anger. Uh, you either feel it, you can feel it, let it run through you. And then you're like, I'm gonna take a step back and just recognize that as anger, but I'm gonna choose these other feelings that I've been working on and I've been meditating on and I've been thinking about. And those make me feel better. And because they make you feel better, eventually you will, um, eventually you'll get the habit of, um, I'm going to go to the things that make me feel good, even though my brain right now is telling me to panic, is telling me to be upset at this thing. Um, it's like, no, I feel this. I'm just going to be with it and give it that space. Um, and then I will proceed. And maybe, who knows, maybe you're just going to be mad. Or maybe you're going to be like, mm, I'm going to build. I, I used to get upset at that thing. Now I'm not going to get so upset at that anymore and build that habit. And six months later, you'll be like, boy, that used to really make me angry. Or boy, that used to really fill me with anxiety. But I practiced my way in particular of letting that go. My way of letting things go is not John Shrum's way of letting things go, is not the hundreds of people on this webinar's way of letting it go. So having the practice lets you understand how things feel inside of you, and then you proceed in accordingly, because you the boss. So be in charge of things as much as you can. Again, much of this is out of your control, but what is in your control, um, you just become practiced in feeling how you can manage it, and eventually you will be able to manage it differently. You won't win every time, trust me, but you'll get better at it, um, and you'll find yourself in a different space that you will thoroughly enjoy. Well, thanks, Damien. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, all of these experts who have shared their information and expertise with us, Dr. Kevin Allshuler, Kathy Costello, and of course, Damien Washington. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, your insights, and for everyone's engagement in today's webinar. Please remember that a recording of this webinar will be made available on the Society's website, and now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continually improve and it helps shape future webinars. The, summer, the survey only takes one minute and makes a difference. So please take a minute and fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Kevin Allshuler, Kathy Costello, Damian Washington, and the National MS Society. I want to thank you once again for joining us. Stay safe and make healthy choices. Fantastic.